Thank you so much for coming. I'd like to welcome you, you all to SOAS. Um, this is the seventh annual Centre for Migration and Diaspora Studies lecture. I can't really believe I'm saying that. It seemed, seems only like yesterday when I was introducing Sydney Mints when the centre started. And those seven years have gone very quickly. And in that time, our membership has expanded, our activities has expanded, and our, the number of students we have working on issues of migration and diaspora has also expanded along with our academic staff. Um, all of which is great, and we've also, in the last two years, got involved ourselves in a lot more outreach projects. So we're now involved in local community oral history projects, um, in theatre projects, working with young asylum seekers, uh, British South Asian theatre project, to name but a few. There's quite a lot of things that have been happening, as well as exhibitions, book launches, etc., etc. All of which is great, but um, perhaps the thing I'm most proud of is our SOAS students, because they, all of them, well, not all of them, but about a large number of them, get involved in activities beyond their academic studies. Okay, so we have many groups here that work with migrant organisations, work with diaspora groups in London and beyond. So I'd like to mention the SOAS Detainee Support Group. It's going to be 10 years old next year, would you believe it? And it's a fantastic um, organisation put together by our students, which is uh, uh, flourishing, unfortunately in some ways, but it's going from strength to strength. The other thing I'd like to mention is SARS goes to Calais. Anybody here that went to Calais at the weekend? Yay, well, I think you deserve a round of applause, even though there is any kind of representative here. SARS goes to Calais is a group um, that goes over to Calais to support the migrants there. There's a Cayley band that goes over and plays music and joins in with a protest, actually, at Calais. And this last weekend, a lot of them went en masse from SARS to demonstrate in Calais, which is fantastic. Uh, we also have... Um, of course, our Justice for Cleaners campaign and a refugee group which is being started by the undergraduates. So a lot of our students are really involved in these issues uh, in a very real way. And perhaps in the current climate that's not entirely surprising. We are all, I'm sure you're acutely aware, uh, of the central place of migration and migrants, of questions of belonging, ideas of citizenship in contemporary Britain. And with the upcoming election, public discourse is reaching something of a frenzy. And it's, uh, quite ironic because the topic that people keep saying can't be spoken about is possibly the most talked about topic uh, in the country at the moment. Um, it's even worse at the moment if you can say that. We have the Rochester by-election coming up tomorrow. Dear old Mark Reckless has come up with this plan to send Polish builders back on boats to where they came from. Good luck with that. And if we look around us, all we see is reports, opinions, newspaper articles, <coughs> all of which are asking to make judgments about migration and migrants in rather simplistic terms. We're asked to decide if they're good or bad migrants, whether they're economically beneficial, all of which ignores the rather mundane fact that migration and migrants are an integral part of this country and have been for quite some period of time. The simple truth is that without migration, there would need be no Britain as we know it. We're also, I think, acutely aware of the disparity between public opinion and the facts. Okay, a lot of us would argue that it's not migrants who are causing problems with access to housing, to schools, to the NHS and to jobs, but a lack of investment and training in this country, which is tied up with the wider sort of so-called project of austerity. We're also aware about the myths surrounding migration. Benefit tourism, for example, which was in the news yesterday, you know, just one of many, yeah? Three percent of migrants claim benefit tourism, the public thinks it's something like 30%. So there's a huge disparity between facts and the fictions of migration which are circulated on a daily basis. <coughs> so in some ways, these issues have always been present. We know, you know, in the 16th century, they were claiming there were too many migrants in this country, they should send them home. Um, but we have been a visible presence in this country for quite some time. It's 66 years since um, the Windrush docked at Tilbury. And we fought our struggles, and we've won many of them. In some ways, the social and political landscapes have been forever changed by our presence. In other ways, background, uh, background of uh, racialization and marginalization are depressingly similar. Even if the new migrants are not quite the same, and those who have been here a bit longer are sometimes happy to believe in the migration myths circulated in public discourse. The problem is, of course, that politicians are only too happy to address these public concerns, and this creates a situation where migrants are affected in multiple ways. So what we have overall is a complex and rather contradictory picture which emerges from across the country of different views, attitudes and approaches to migration. There is much negativity, but alongside this paranoia and fear, we're also very capable 
as a country of celebrating diversity and often recognising its benefits and just coexisting side by side in very mundane and ordinary ways. Now, Paul Gilroy has famously argued a few years back that there's no longer what we might call a black community in Britain because the fight to belong to a <coughs> national community has largely been won. But of course, it's not really that simple. New forms of exclusion and inclusion, new hierarchies of belonging, to borrow the title of this talk, continue to emerge. And when I was thinking about how to introduce our speakers, I was reminded of the famous lyric by Toni Morrison, Whose House Is This? Uh, These are uh, um, lyrics which really, for me, evoke feelings of alienation and belonging and what we do about that. Some of us do feel at home in Britain, and that, of course, requires being proper members of a political and social community. Others still have an intense sense of unhomeliness, of unbelonging, and people continue, <coughs> and continue maybe to be acutely aware that however long we're here, uh, that sense of belonging might never come. Uh, I was in a taxi just recently with a Bangladeshi driver, and um, it won't surprise my students to know that we were talking about cricket. And <laughs> <laughs> during the conversation, he said to me he'd been here since the 1960s, but he still did not feel as if he belonged in Britain, that he still felt like an outsider. Now, that was not what was shocking to me. What is really more shocking to me is how often people say that to me, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we have to think about. When do we stop being migrants? When will people stop asking us where we come from? Yeah? Who belongs and who doesn't? And how do those hierarchies belonging shift over time and space? And that's going to be the subject of what Les Back, Shamsa Sinha, and Charlene Bryan are going to be addressing today. So I just want to introduce the speakers very briefly to you and then hand over to them. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Les back uh, to speak at SARS. Um, my students have been absolutely delighted, I have to tell him that. <laughs> the things about Les back coming, although there's one thing I might not forgive you for, Les, and that's the number of years and hours I've had to spend now discussing whether the dance hall is a democratic space or not. <laughs> one of Les's older articles that the students particularly sort of take up and um, uh, enjoy debating. Les's work is relevant, engaged, and thoughtful, and that's why they respond to it. He's a goldsmith's boy through and through. He studied at Goldsmiths and after a brief foray into the big wide world, well, Birmingham, yeah, got as far as Birmingham, <laughs> cultural studies department, very amiable. He went back to Goldsmiths where he worked with the Centre for Urban and Community Research. Now that centre is, going, is, has, is 20 years old this year. Yeah, it's amazing it's been there that long. <coughs> and of course, it's known for very innovative, groundbreaking work rooted in its local communities, um, doing research that really matters and trying to impact on public policy through that research as well. So, you know, it, that's been great. Les's main fields of interest are the sociology of racism, popular culture, music, football, and city life. And his work attempts to create a sensuous or live sociology committed to searching for new modes of sociological writing and representation. And I think that's partly what we're going to be seeing this evening. Uh, the presenters are going to try and move away from just speaking at you and doing something more performative and experimental? <coughs> Possibly. OK. And this approach of Les's was outlined <laughs> in the article. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Yeah. Anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Right. This approach was outlined in the Art of Listening, which was, uh, came out in 2007, and is also linked to the new book project he's working on with Shamsa and Charlene, called Migrant City, which is being published next year. And I think what we're going to hear tonight is a section from that book. And he believes in collaborative work, and this paper is based on a project conducted with his two colleagues here, which I think involved interviewing 30 young migrants in, in London. Charlene is a graduate of psychosocial studies at the University of East London. She's interested in education studies and is currently doing her teacher's training in primary education. And I'd like to thank Charlene, because it was after reading your biography that I thought of Tony Morrison. So thank you for that. Yeah. She has worked with Les and Shamsa compiling a, scrap a scrapbook for new hierarchies of belonging. Uh, this featured pictures, thoughts, and poems. She's a believer that we all need a creative outlook in a world where creativity sometimes gets lost. And that's particularly true, I think, unfortunately, in academia. So through her poems, she hopes to provide an exploration of contemporary issues relevant to academic research, but also connected with people on a deeper and more personal level. And last but by no means least, the Shamsar Singha, who's a senior lecturer in sociology and youth studies at university campus Suffolk. And his interests include the study of racism in youth, and in particular, he has worked a lot with separated and unaccompanied young people. Methodologically, Shamsar's interests lie in experimenting with moving away from working with research participants 
and involving them as co-authors. And I think we'd all be really interested in how uh, he thinks we can achieve that. So in this lecture, what they're going to talk about is how the so-called crisis of multiculturalism is affecting the regulation, scrutiny, and surveillance of migrant communities, which is a big problem. As some of you might have heard that there are 50 Muslim charities at the moment which are being uh, monitored, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to do this through the story of a young migrant and explore the ways that the old hierarchies of belonging are taking new forms within the social landscape of contemporary London. <coughs> This biographical case study is drawn from a larger qualitative study of 30 young migrants, as I said. So, shall I hand over to yeah. the three of you now? Yeah. And we'd like to just give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Listen, it's such a, uh, an honour and also a pleasure to be here, and so many of you, to, to come to tonight's session. So, what we've got planned for you is something a little bit different, we hope. Uh, the project that we're going to be talking about is a book that we're close to completion. Uh, it, it's really the story of London through the, the eyes and ears of 30 adult migrants. And in the book, what we've tried to do is to really take the idea of collaborative work very seriously at all levels, you know, from the way we've conducted the work to the way we've analysed the work and now the way that we're going to try and communicate it. And I thought what might be nice is to start with a, the problem that has been kind of perplexing us, and that's you know, the degree to which a city like London and a society like Britain is transformed. And I just wanted to bring the voice of Stuart Hall into the room, who passed away very sadly. And from a, a, an interview with him, which you know, neatly connects to the points that Perry was saying, called at home and not at home. So let's just hear from Stuart. Well, uh, things are not going so well, really. Mm -hmm. you know, there hasn't been a profound change in yeah. British society. We haven't got to the deep level of yes, racism in the culture that I think throbs on. Yeah. Well, there's nothing changed. Mm -hmm. Yes, something has changed. What has changed is you go into the street and, you know, I came here in 1951 and it just looks different. Britain will never go back to being a homogenous, cultural, culturally homogenous society mm. ever again. Yeah. It can't. I mean, it can have bridges and yeah. throw people out into the sea, yeah. but it can't go back to being, you know, stable and steady on its own monoculture foundations. Yes. It can't happen. So there's no going back. I mean, just think about the walk here. It always strikes me, you know, what must it have been like for someone like Stuart Hall you know, to get off of the train and encounter Britain in, you know, in the forties as he did. There's no going back. And yet we have, as Pyro very eloquently said, you know, a kind of auction of kind of moral judgments, what Doug Massey calls anti-immigrant times. You know, every day, ceaseless, talk about the problem of immigration. Now, the short version of the argument that we want to try and present tonight is, well, if there's no going back, what's happening in our moment now? Well, our argument is that what's happening in our, in our moment now is a kind of reordering, a sifting of difference along new hierarchies of belonging. So if there's no going back, then how does the work of racism unfold in our time? And we would argue that it unfolds through creating hierarchies of belonging, a kind of ladder of entitlement within the context of British society as a whole and London life particularly. And what we've been trying to think about is, you know, how to really speak back to the talk about the crisis of multiculturalism, the so-called death of multiculturalism, the moral panics about terrorism and so on, and the constant state of crisis that we seem to, con to be in at, any, at every moment. And in a way, what we're trying to argue is that the crisis of multiculturalism <coughs> becomes a kind of self-perpetuating phenomena, where the atmosphere of crisis <coughs> is policing a crisis that, in fact, it produced in the first place. Right? The atmosphere of crisis is policing a crisis that it produced in the first place. 
That's why, you know, the, the, the headlines in the newspapers declare every day the latest anxiety of anti-immigrant times. And what we've been trying to do in this project, which we've been doing for five years, is to, is to try and find a way to introduce a different kind of story of what it means to live in a profoundly multicultural city. One of our characterizations of that reality is that we live in a world of divided connectedness, paradoxical, <coughs> divided connectedness, where our mobile phones you know, connect us potentially around the, globally around the world, but they can be the very same instrument through which UKBA and the Home Office used to try and police and trap people. You know, the, we got involved in last year the scandal about the go-home texting campaign. I don't know if you've heard about that. It was one of, it was actually, I think it was Shampshire and I's proudest moment when David Cameron was forced to make a statement in Parliament about it. A world of divided connectedness. <coughs> now, you know, I guess many of you will have encountered ideas about the changing relationship between time and, and place, time, space, compression, and so on. But just, I just wanted to show you this very quickly as, as a way of trying to to make a simple point of what it means to live in this paradoxically divided and connected world. So Paru mentioned the Windrush. So the Windrush travelled at 15 miles an hour and brought 492 colonial citizens, not immigrants, colonial citizens, to Tilbury. It took 22 days. You know, in, tw in 2012 when I did this calculation, the same journey on Air Jamaica, travelling at 175 miles per hour, costing <coughs> somewhere between 600 uh, pounds, 800 so euros, took nine hours. In a way, that kind of makes very palpable and very clear the shifts in the relationship between human mobility. But the thing that comes through in the work that we've done is that experience of mobility in a, in a globalised world is profoundly uneven. There are some people who can move quickly and freely, and others who can't. And London, as a kind of world city of multiculture, is, is a particularly interesting, important case. I just wanted to show you these statistics, not to try and, and be um, impressive in any way, but just to sort of point to this very interesting phenomenon. If you look at the, dis the growth of London as a city between 2001 and 2011, London is increased by around a million people. And that increase is almost completely accounted for by the number of non-UK passport holders. And that those young people predominantly, and this is the sort of age pyramid of that, are no longer dominated by male migrants, but in terms of gender, they're more or less balanced. So when John Berger wrote his famous book, A Seventh Man, with, with um, Jean Moore, in the 70s, a book that we've been very inspired by, the title tells you everything in a way. Every seventh man in Europe at that time was a migrant. Today, in London, where people of migrant origin number somewhere around three million, almost every second man and woman as we walk down the Charing Cross Road, is a mine. The 30 lives that we've, people that we've worked with over the last five years, have just tried to represent in this beautiful map that Rachel Murray made for us as a visualisation, the sort of threads of connection. And it, I think this in a way shows, uh, in, in a snapshot, the, the, the sort of places that London's life is linked to in the context of our project. We've also went through this experiment of trying to represent those movements as single <coughs> lines. As you can see, some of those lines <coughs> are fairly <coughs> straight, and others are very circuitous. The circuitous <coughs> wiggly line is a clue, often a clue to the ways in which some people's movement across nation states takes on this kind of circuitous, fugitive line, fugitive route. 
And one of the things that we've been trying to do is, is to argue against, or at least to try and problematise what we've called, and others have called, a migrancy problem act, to try and connect the experience of global mobility in our time with the sort of dynamisms of racism, racism in our society. And the other thing that we've tried to do, and I'm trying to get through this so we can get to the good parts of this talk, is, is to take seriously the idea of, well, what would a sociable kind of sociology be like? You know, the way in which we do our research often is not very sociable. You know, we find a quiet place, we take a tape recorder or a, or a digital voice recorder these days and ask people to tell their stories and then we, run, well, then we run away. Whereas what we've been trying to do is to, cr is to use a whole range of devices from <coughs> photography to writing <coughs> to creating scrapbooks as a, a way of pluralising the vantage points of observation. In a way, what we wanted to try and do is to work with the participants in our, in our project uh, so that we could pluralise the vantage points of observation to make the participants observers in their own lives. Yeah. That's not to necessarily flatten or simplify that for observation, but to, in a way, make those observations part of, a, of another dialogue, and we're going to give you an example of that in a minute. <coughs> so, to develop mobile modes of attentiveness. And widen or shift the analytic frames. And so, we're going to basically talk about one part of this experiment, which involves my friend and colleague over there, Charlene Bryan, who was one of the participants in the project. And Charlene's going to uh, read some of the, she's going to introduce herself briefly, and then she's going to read some things that she made for the project. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how that process of, of writing produced a whole series of, of dialogues that resulted in the argument that we want to make about the emergence of these new hierarchies of belonging. So Charlene. You may have guessed by now that I am a migrant. Um, I've been asked to say some biographical bits about myself, but Paru covered most of what I wanted to say. Um, so the only thing I can add is that I came here in 2006, that's roughly eight years ago, and I came here to study. Um, and then I met my husband, who is in the house. Um, and so I've decided not to go home because he's here, so why would I be there? Um, I studied at UEL and that's where I met Shamsha. Um, he was my seminar tutor and I didn't like him very much. <laughs> that being said, after I left, we uh, bounced each other up on a train from Leytonstone and um, I was asked to take part in the Euromagins project that he was working on. And of course, being the person who likes to be in everything, I said yes. Um, so here I am today. <laughs> going to read you one of the poems that I did um, for the study. Um, it was called On the Inside. She looked at me, eyes piercing through my skin. It was as though she knew that this was the first time I had ever been. I registered the contempt plastered on her face. Her rigid posture screamed, foreigner, know your place. As I stood there, hiding the unspoken message, she had no choice but to bid me safe passage. Still, I was puzzled. I posed not a threat to her, but I knew she felt threatened because I was an outsider. She must have heard it in my accent or guessed because of the excited twinkle in my eye. Maybe she felt the unbridled energy pulsing through me aimed at the sky. But when she gave me my passport, suddenly I knew. She didn't want me here for fear that I would show her up because she, with all her British chit chat, was an outsider too. The people who segregate us the most are our own people. The people we segregate the most are our own. 
We categorize and we label. We place everyone into a box. We bag them, we tag them, and we leave them there until an instant causes us to reach into our existing ideas and retrieve our neatly packaged boxes. Taking part in the Euromagin study, I was able to reflect sociologically on my own position within the dynamics that I have struggled against since I came here. As a migrant Londoner, <laughs> I myself was fighting to find a place in a city filled with people who had come before me. I wanted to fit in, but I was always afraid that I never would. And in a way, I guess I never will. I am just too Dominican. But what of those who do fit in, I mean? I wanted to show through my poem that us migrants, we all go through this battle at some point. The battle first to prove that we are good enough, and then the battle to prove that we are better, better than those who come after us. We always have a point to prove. Our position, however, is a fragile one. As the study and the poem shows, this is because we try to elevate ourselves. We try to bring ourselves up to a certain status as migrants, but the new migrant people who come in remind us that no matter how long we remain in this city, we never really fully belong. Someone will always come up to us on the bus in our workplace and ask us, where are you from? How many of you have had that? In the poem, it is the migrant immigration officer who reminds me of my own place, my own box. It would appear that she was threatened by me. Why? I didn't know. But then, thinking through it, I realized that I reminded her of what she used to be. Probably not directly, but what someone she knew used to be. Of course, my accent is a dead giveaway that I am foreign. My immigration worker, who has a British accent, she may have adopted her accent or she may have been born British. I will never know for sure. But accents always tend to be a dead giveaway, whether we like it or not. I'm struggling at the moment because I'm learning to speak phonics the way that we teach our children to speak. <laughs> and my accent stops me saying certain sounds. I'm a migrant, so I use that as an excuse. <laughs> Through the poem, I showed that I was labeled. Later on, however, I found myself labeling others as well. And that is the dilemma that I think sometimes we all face. I always <coughs> was asking, why are they acting like that? Why are they speaking like that? Why are they saying I don't speak English? Did they not come to England? Looking at people critically is something that I found I did as a migrant more often than I should have more often that I think that if I was told I was doing it then, I would say no, I wasn't, but I was. In many ways, I have moved myself up to the next level by making people, by asking the questions, why are they acting like that? Why are they talking like that? I have moved myself up to the next level. I catch myself turning up my nose <clears throat> and think now, there it is. I am caught in this dynamic where even though I try consciously not to, how can I not? As a migrant in the city of London, no matter how much I try to distance myself from who I am, where I'm from, I will always be Charlene, the lady who is foreign. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name's Shamshir. Um, so I'm going to start by picking up on the, the stuff about ranking and ordering and bagging and tagging. That was one of the phrases you used, right? Bagging and tagging. Um, <coughs> I'd been doing a piece of research prior to the EU margin study 
in Hackney, Newman Tower, Hamlets, um, which was about sexual health and young people, and also some associated work with unaccompanied asylum seekers, and just talking to, to young people ostensibly about you know contraception, protection, uh, sexual behaviour, um, intimate relationships, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but what I noticed was something about, something new was happening, something new was emerging. This was in sort of 2004, 2002, 2003, 2004, that I hadn't heard so much before. And that was the way in which uh, people who maybe would have been written about as outsiders 10 years previously and possibly still would be written about as such today in the kinds of books around race and ethnicity that I read as an undergraduate um, were ranking and ordering other people and themselves and necessarily as a reflection of that placing themselves within some kind of ranking and ordering. So um, some young Somalis I recall were being told that they weren't proper blacks because they sounded Arab, uh, their hair was different. Um, alongside this, there were uh, young Kosovans asking, you know, what are you doing here? Um, you shouldn't be here, you shouldn't be in this country. Uh, and that was done by the sons and daughters of migrants. Um, and I thought, well, what, what's at stake here? Um, and, I, I, you know, and, and I thought about it in relation to Fanon's work, which we use in some of our articles and stuff as well. And, and what's at stake in putting someone else down so you feel higher yourself? What's at stake in that? Not only psychosocially, but what is that related to materially? In wealth and opportunities, in jobs, in housing, in in the way two different mothers might be treated differently at a crash. Um, and uh, as we spoke and talked with the other people who were taking part in our work on the EU margin study, we began to see how, okay, um, if you're undocumented, you might not have the, uh, you won't have the right to work. Um, your position regarding welfare would be precarious to say the least. If you're seeking asylum, maybe there is some level of uh, welfare rights you get if they've been administered correctly. Um, but you're very unlikely to have the right to work uh, unless the Home Office would have, uh, unless the Home Office have acknowledged a mistake they've made and because they can't make a decision at that time they issue a national insurance card so maybe then you'd have a right to work. But then there are also those people who do have right, the right to work, such as uh, non-EU students on student visas, but that right to work is limited in terms of hours. And then you have uh, EU migrants and the, uh, who have uh, the right to work in the UK, and they can be here for whatever period of time. That doesn't mean to say they don't suffer uh, modes of exclusion, um, but it's just a way of saying that there is some kind of mapping taking place as a response to the fact that um, there is this multicultural drift, yet at the same time people are coming in. People are coming into London and different parts of the UK and different parts of Europe as well. And that, that drift and that hierarchy that's produced, I began to think about that and thinking about the old stuff that I'd read about racism, people like Gobinau, is that how I forget? I'm not sure, is that, is that how you pronounce his name, Gobinau? Uh, sort of the racial scientist of the 19th century and there's you know, a range of other racial scientists and the way they draw their diagrams of different races who had different places in hierarchies of belonging that related to quite overt biological categories of race and the ways in which there seems to be a reworking but another kind of way of imposing a set of racial categories um, on people related to what they can do, where they can go, what resources they can access, but in a very real sense, how they feel about themselves, what worlds are they held in within their own minds. And uh, 
I guess that's why I, the work of Fanon spoke to us, especially in this particular chapter that we're talking to you about. And uh, I'll hand over to you now, Les. Yeah. So this is how the, the uh, I need to tell you this, a very small story about what, how we worked to try and illustrate the point that uh, I, I think is, is really important that Shams just touched on. So we would invite people, Charlene in this case, to write something, we would, and then we would get together and talk about it. And I remember um, the second time that we got, to, we got together to talk about the scrapbook and also the poem, that um, we drafted a version of the argument that we're trying to present to you tonight. And uh, Shamsha got up and went to the, to the loo at one point. And Shine just took me by the arm, I remember this, and said, you know, how do you know this stuff about me? How do you know all this stuff about me? And it was a really wonderful moment because um, I just remember turning to you and saying, well, we know, Charlene, because you told us. <laughs> and I'm sure she'll have her own version of this conversation in a minute. It was, we've talked about it since. But I, what we were trying to do, in a way, was to create a kind of a movement of imagination. Use the, the writings as a, kind of, as, as a kind of sphere for dialogue. And, and in a way, I think what's so powerful in what Charlene wrote, and then how, what we talked about, is exactly that sense of a double movement that, that she talks about. The encounter with the black immigration officer. You know, I'm sure the Home Office like to parade as their credentials for it being a multicultural institution, right? The Home Office can't be racist or the UK, but look at our workforce, right? So on the one hand, there's that kind of encounter. But then the other thing that she, she talked about so eloquently, and, and others have too, are the moment when she catches herself in that process of putting others lower on this sort of steps, if you like, of, of belonging. That double movement of catching that process. Now, what we're trying to think about is how the checkpoint doesn't stay at the edge of the political territory any longer. Maybe it never did, but moves into our most intimate personal spaces, right? The mobile phone in our pocket, you know, and those people who get text messages from UKBA, or for that matter, the way in which university teachers become complicit with the process of bordering and monitoring overseas students by the way in which the Home Office is using class registers. So that, that sense of, of complicity isn't just, I mean, I, I want to say my main point from this segment is to say, well, we are talking about, and we think it's important to talk about that process of hierarchization that's going on amongst people who are living migrant lives and are part of migrant families. But at the same time, I think what we want to try and argue is that this is a process that makes us, that in a way, calls us all into a sense of implication in different ways and perhaps at different levels. And in a way, I think that's what makes Franz Fanon's writing such a resource for us now. And the link that there is, I think, between the way he and others were trying to understand colonial racism as we move into this really difficult, neoliberal, sort of, quotes, post-colonial moment. It seems to me that Fanon's insights and Fanon's writings about precisely that way in which we become complicit in these forms of power are more relevant now, or as relevant now, as they were when he was writing. Particularly his essays in Towards an African Revolution. I think I read those essays, and we've something that we've thought about a lot in the context of the project, and they seem so incredibly relevant to us now. Okay, so, shall we? I'm going to take us in a slightly different direction. Um, majority of what I'm going to say now doesn't link to what Liz has just said. But I will be talking about the scrapbook. Uh, when asked to do the study, I wasn't sure what exactly to do. And um, so Liz said to me, go home and have a little think about it. And maybe you could do pictures, or maybe you could do whatever you like. And so I 
first started walking around London with my camera that Les borrowed to me, so it wasn't really my camera, actually. Um, and I started taking pictures of things that I felt um, I connected with. And then I wrote bits because I am more of a writer than a picture taker, really. I'm not a photographer. Um, I am more of a poet. And so I decided to write bits on the reasons why I chose those particular areas in London to put in my scrapbook and the reasons why I felt like I connected with them. And as you may have already picked up from my talk and Les and Shamshers, is that I am more of a sensationalist than they are. <laughs> so. Um. Right. <coughs> so. Every moment encompasses past, present, and future. Within us lies a complexity of time because we are never present. We are never really in the moment, even when we are. This idea ties in very nicely with my own experiences in London. As a migrant, I am always placed between past, present, and future. Each experience I have, I try to place it within a context. As a migrant, I organize my life around commonalities. I try to find things which connect me to Dominica, while at the same time, places me within London. And these places here did just that. I mean, we don't have a Tower of London in Dominica, of course, but um, the sunset here over the London Bridge, Tower Bridge, that's it, is, um, is what I, f I focused on. Um, <laughs> I try to find things, of course, that connects me. And so it is here that I recognize that I am in the past while I remain deeply rooted in the present. The sun is really important to me. Even today, it still baffles me that that sun which sets in London is the same sun that sets in Dominica. Time difference being taken into consideration and all that. We do have, I think it's four hours behind now and it's normally five hours in the summer. So when I first came here, I was thinking it can't be the same sun, obviously. It must be a different sun, but it turns out that it is the same sun. <laughs> right. So in my scrapbook, as you see on the screen, I am captivated by London. I am in love with this city happy that my experiences are shaped by it. At the same time, I still try to link it to Dominica. <coughs> I take myself back there, even while I'm here. I make every moment that I think about in this time about the home that I've left behind back then. My friends, some of them here, will tell you that my every next word is a story about something I did on the island. Not if you agree, friends. <laughs> right, it's always something about home, something about my dad, something about my sister. Although this is my home, today, now, is my time, my past, present, and future allows me to relate to London in one sense, but on the other hand, it also allows me to maintain my identity as a Dominican, a lady from the Commonwealth of Dominica, not the Dominican Republic, as a lot of people seem to think. And in the beginning, I did speak a lot to Les about the um, confusion about where I was from. And I still get it sometimes when I say to people that I am from Dominica. They say, oh, I know where that is. It's the Dominican Republic. I say, no, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> and it still really upsets me even now that people don't know that I'm from Dominica, not the Dominican Republic, and that it is two different places. I did say to Les, I think, I can't remember if Les remembers this, but I did say to Les that I was tempted early on to walk around with a map of the Caribbean on me, <laughs> just to point it out. But I didn't have to because I had to calm myself down. <laughs> um, and so doing the scrapbook and, and taking part in this study did remind me that 
I am connected. I am connected like a lot of us in a lot of ways. Connected to the place that I came from and connected to the place that I am here. That even though earlier on I said that I will never really belong, in a way I do belong in London. I belong here like every other migrant. I've, I've got a community of people from Dominica or people from the Caribbean as a whole. Um, and people from Ghana because I got married to a Ghanaian and I've got friends who are Ghanaians. Yeah, yeah. Mentioned you, <laughs> um, and and because of that, I I've now widened my community. I've I've widened it to a place where I can I can go and sit down and say I am actually a part of this. I I do actually belong there. And even though I take myself away from that and say I will never fully be a Londoner, which I won't, I do recognize that I do have home right here in this country. Thanks. So I'm going to draw some strands together. Just something from what Les said and something from what Charlene was saying. Les talked a bit briefly about border control and the ways in which border control has moved from the extremity of the national border into what we do as lecturers or um, what GPs do or what your A&E people at accident and emergency at the local hospital do, i.e. checking your immigration status. I um, want to draw that strand together with this notion of uh, is it the same sun that Charlene briefly mentioned just then. Because the ways in which, when we were talking to young migrants on the study, particularly to, to certain young migrants, the ways in which they were conceiving of space and time were directly related to uh, immigration surveillance and its material and cultural fallout. Um, so, I'll give you one example which I'll condense. is a, a, a young woman who's from Ethiopia and um, she went to her local creche to put her baby in the creche so she could go on to do her um, college course, art and design, very good. She's a very good painter. In fact, she painted some stuff for us, which we're uh, very lucky to have. Um, and it was only when she put her daughter, son, in the creche um, that the people at the creche rang through to, I believe, it was the local council to check whether she had the, you know, the correct kind of permissions that she could get a, um, that she could have access to that crash. It was only at that point um, that her number that she gave them didn't check out her immigration number, and it was at that point that she came under immigration surveillance because, as it turned out her current immigration visa had run out and the solicitor who she was um, who was meant to be representing her had not applied for a further visa for her to stay in the country um, and this, this meant that yeah that this rendered her um, subject to you know this rendered her, this meant that she didn't have automatic rights to um, a range of welfare and a range of benefits although her local council put her in some emergency accommodation. At that point, this is where the, the space and time thing comes in, she, her surroundings were quite dangerous, dangerous for her baby. Uh, there were lots of um, needles in the doorways and uh, piss and you know, whatever and so on. And it was quite dangerous for her, she felt. And so she was, she was wary about going out. So that constraint started to circle around her. If she couldn't go out and live in the present, then she tried to mentally think of the past and of the future. As the immigration constraints and the uncertainty around whether she would be deported heightened, she found she couldn't think of the future anymore. She couldn't envisage that brighter future anymore, so where did she go? She went to the past. Only a past 
had uh, family members whom she didn't have contact with, one of whom she didn't know where he was, and another of whom was very ill and she couldn't reach her mother. Um, and the past, that revisiting, or revisiting of the past for her was quite traumatic. And that can, that the way in which uh, space and time contracted around her uh, was a direct result of the fallout of her uncertainties around her immigration status. Now I want to counterpose that kind of view of what happens to people and oh, oh, the other thing I want to say on that is when you can't, when you don't have your past, your present and your future then that can affect your, affect your sense of self and you know your mental well-being and so on as you, you could imagine from the, from the kinds of uncertain circumstances she was living in. So I want to counterpose that with the world of, say, um, what's Putnam's first name? Robert. David? Robert. Robert Putnam. Um, and some of his stuff about hunkering down. And that philosophy or that way of the, that automatic way of thinking that's echoed um, in the politics we read and see and hear and in lots of sociology and uh, in various places, you know. Um, is that somehow diversity is going to put in danger how we're connecting and living with each other. But what we say in, in the hierarchies of belonging stuff that we've written is that it's racism that produces this. It's racism that produces these different hierarchies. It's racism that means that uh, th th this particular young woman from Ethiopia um, couldn't have her children at the local crash, her son at the local crash. And that is the social weight of racism and its material context and its material fallout that have a deep psychosocial fallout for people who wonder where their place is philosophically, physically. And it's that kind of degradation of the human spirit and sometimes the attack on the ego that produces that kind of displacement, that kind of need to put someone else even further down to show you're above them if you are that person on board of control who sees shining coming through or, or whatever context it might be. Um, I reckon that's it. <laughs>